Good morning. Good morning. They threw me a curveball. I'm glad I didn't stand up between the two numbers. <laughs> we give thanks to God for this special day in the life of the First Presbyterian Church of Lawrence, South Carolina. Rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say again, rejoice. First thing we'd like to do is to thank the visitors for coming today. We hope that you will find the service to be meaningful and we'll come back. We ask you to pass the ritual of friendship from your right to the left so we'll know um, who came today. There are a bunch of announcements. I'll try to be brief. The first and probably most recent updates is Mary Burris had her hip surgery at Lawrence Hospital and is doing well and is hopefully going home tomorrow. She didn't want to go to the rehab facility, but believe me, she got plenty of people around to help her out that's extended family, so she's doing well. Julie Rains, who ran into the mouth of a dog about a week ago, and lost the battle, um, was in the hospital. Um, her main problem was getting the infection under control, but that's under control. Um, she actually looks great except for her two arms, uh, and she had to have some hardware put in the left arm and is having trouble with, with the left, left hand functioning, um, but she's already out and about and uh, is handling it very well. Wayne Wicker is to have surgery in Greenville on Tuesday, so we need to be praying for him. He's been tough and been here on most Sundays lately despite all of his pain. Bob Morris, good news and bad news. He's got to take a lot of pills every day, but at least it's not IV, and at least he's not in the hospital. So we, we pray for Bob and for him to have as few side effects as possible. This afternoon we have a reception in Hunter Hall um, after the 3 p.m. 3 p.m. installation service uh, to welcome the McCracken family and light freshments will be uh, served. Tomorrow is the first prayers uh, night at Roma at 6 p.m. for anybody who would like to come. And next Saturday is the roadside pickup on Huiglan Road where it goes up the bank and runs into Welcome Church Baptist parking lot at 8.30. Usually takes a couple of hours. Make sure you wear long pants. Um, and for the next few weeks, if you'll try to remember to fill out the name tags and wear them for a few weeks until they fall off so the McCracken family can sort of know who's who. Vacation Bible School, June 18th through 21st. And if you want to come for the next few Sundays and help the choir out, you can come at 1030. They'll rehearse some simple songs. Simple, simple songs. And uh, if you want to try out, then uh, you'd be more than welcome. Okay. Now the good part. Last September, uh, I got a phone call at home, and it was from a minister from Kansas. I was about to give him the usual response of, we'll be glad to read your piff and call you back after we've finished. But then I thought, I don't remember reading a piff on this fellow. Well, there was a little silence, and then he said, well, I don't really have a piff out there. He said that I was, I'm not actually looking for a church, but I liked your mission statement. And if you read the vine this past week, that's what Carol mentioned. She mentioned and wrote about our mission, our mission statement that we had made several years ago um, under Larry. So this is sort of intriguing to me. And we talk more about family and Montreat and sports and his preference for smaller towns, especially the Carolinas area, even though his compass might have been a little bit north, but we'll work on him there. Um, and um, then I thought, you know, this is a really good fellow. Then the PNC got to work and read his hot off the press piff. It was there soon. And we talked to several references, all very good. 
and talked with him via conference call and then thought, this may be the one. Our PNC then drove up on a cold, snowy day to West Jefferson, North Carolina in January to hear him preach and talk afterward. Mike's parents had moved there uh, several years before and um, while he was in seminary, he would go back there and help at the church and preach a few sermons. The sermon was very good and the lunch was at the best place in town according to Mike and TripAdvisor. We had to do something while we were riding three and a half hours going to West Jefferson, North Carolina. And in a quiet corner, we had a good conversation, a good session with questions to him and a few good questions from him. Now this took place uh, in an area that, uh, uh, an establishment that had a lot of widescreen TVs blasting the NFL football games with the usual loud yays and boos according to which team you were pulling for. And it was on the afternoon when there was not much else to do in that little town other than sit around and enjoy many adult beverages. <laughs> yeah, we abstained. We all thought if he could, he could handle our fairly difficult questions in that setting, that he probably could handle most of the situation in the first prayer Lawrence. We then smuggled into Lawrence one evening with his family to talk and see our church. <laughs> and the family is a joy to be with. He then prepared his statement of faith and faith journey for our Trinity Presbytery Committee on Ministry to examine him. And when we read this, it was icing on the cake. We knew God had, had chosen us, chosen him for us, and Mike said yes. I'd like for you to welcome our 17th pastor to the First Presbyterian Church, Lawrence, Reverend Mike McCracken. Thank you, Byron, and thanks to all of you. I've had the chance to meet so many of you over the course of the last month, and thanks again to all of you who came out to the Presbytery meeting where Trinity Presbytery welcomed me, uh, gosh, last, last month, almost exactly a month ago today. Now, I told you then that we would struggle with names, and... We're still struggling, but we're trying hard. So I'm grateful for the name tags. Uh, please do wear them. Uh, and we will uh, look forward to learning your stories and sharing stories with you as the weeks and months and years go by. It is truly a joy to be here. It's to a joy to see so many newly familiar faces and to see a few... Uh, older familiar faces out in the congregation this morning. It's hard to put into words just how grateful I am and how we are for your hospitality, for the love that you have shown to us, for making a landing after a move of 12 hours in a van last week, which I know you heard about followed by what was supposed to be an idyllic weekend or idyllic week in the mountains at a cabin that we are privileged to go and stay at that actually turned into four solid days of rain with no internet and no television <laughs> and the real potential of becoming the next Stephen King novel. <laughs> so when we arrived here on Thursday evening, we were glad to see you and I know my children were glad to see full bars of service on the cell phones, too. But it's a joy to be here. Thanks to all of you who stopped by the office on Friday and came in and visited and said hello. Uh, thanks to Nathan and Jordan who yelled at me out the window of their car yesterday as Wren was playing in the fountain downtown. Uh, that's how we kind of knew we were at home. So there will be more thank yous, there will be more laughs, there will be more stories to tell as time goes by. But we are indeed overjoyed to be here. It is truly 
an honor and a privilege to stand here and be called your pastor. So friends, with that in mind, let us now turn our hearts and our minds this day to the grateful worship of our loving God. Brothers and sisters, I invite you now to stand and to join me for our call to worship this morning. And I've already messed up. <laughs> Let's let the choir, have a seat, let the choir sing. <laughs> this is going to happen again, so just bear with me. Okay. wanted to make sure. <laughs> Friends, I invite you to join with me. Rise and let us call ourselves to worship this day. We do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. Sisters and brothers, Praise the Lord.
friends, we are a called people, but we are a broken people. And so we are called to stand before the one who created us and wishes to hear us confess our brokenness before God and neighbor so that we may be put back together and made whole again. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us confess our sins first together. In Christ and then in silence. God who formed our inward parts and knows our hearts, forgive us. Instead of acknowledging you as our God, we make our own idols. Instead of proclaiming Jesus Christ as our Lord, we proclaim ourselves. Instead of turning to the Holy Spirit, we attempt to attain your way in our own understanding. Redirect our wrong ways and lead us to the ways that make Jesus visible in our lives. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. In Christ we died to our old selves and became new creations. Therefore we proclaim Jesus Christ as our Lord, and the life of Jesus is in us. Friends, you may be seated. If all the children will come forward. a quick question. Did somebody leave me a note up on the pulpit? Does anybody know? I think somebody did. And I am really, really grateful for it. I don't know if she's here this morning. I heard it was a little girl. So thank you if you're here. And if you're not, we'll thank her when she gets here next week. But I was really excited. It said, I'm looking forward to getting to know you. And you know what? That's the same way I feel about all of y'all. I'm looking forward to getting to know all of y'all. And uh, our family is really looking forward to getting to see everybody too. So I have a quick question for you this morning. Has anybody ever asked you who you belong to? Has anybody ever heard that question? Have you heard that before? Anybody ever asked? Nobody's ever asked you who you belong to? Oh, somebody's pointing. There you go. He knows who he belongs to. All right, maybe that's an older thing. Maybe just old folks like me used to get asked that. Mom and Dad, anybody ever asked y'all who you belong to? Thank you. If y'all had all said no, I would have really... <laughs> you know, after the whole thing. Anyway, uh, so... You know, that happens, though. Sometimes we ask kids who they belong to so we can find their moms and dads. And sometimes when we're moms and dads, when we get older, we wonder who it is that we belong to ourselves. And one of the things we're going to hear about this morning, one of the things we're going to talk about in service is that God is always letting us know that we belong to God. In fact, if there's nothing else that you remember, it's that God loves us so much that we continue through thick and thin to belong to God. And that's really good news. So we belong to mom and dad, and mom and dad belong to us even when they make us mad. Does mom and dad ever make you mad? 
Mm -hmm. What do they do to make you mad? Don't you answer. <laughs> when you don't do something, they kind of make you mad? Yeah, I know. Well, I think God's kind of the same way. But you know what? It doesn't matter what we do or don't do. God continues to say, you belong to me. You're one of mine. And I love you. So we all pray with me? I'm just going to pray. If y'all will repeat after me, uh, we'll do our prayer that way, okay? Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for reminding us that we belong to you. Amen. Thanks, God. You may be seated. Let us join our hearts and our minds together in prayer. Holy and loving God, we pray that your spirit will move among us this day. That the word that is read and the word that is proclaimed shall indeed be written upon the hearts of each one who hears it. We pray this day that your spirit will move not only in this place, but in the places and in the hearts of those whom we love who are not here with us, for those who are sick and who are injured. We pray, Lord, for healing and restoration, and we pray for those who are charged with taking care of them. Lord, may their hands be endowed and bestowed with your mercy and your care and your love. Lord, we come before you this day in a troubled world, one that is surely in need of your presence and your spirit of peace. And so we pray for leaders that they may hear your voice and that they move at your will. We pray for places, Lord, that are racked with violence 
and warfare, places that are troubled with discord and anxiety, be they far away from us or as near to us as our homes. Lord, this day we lift up our joys to you also, the joy of our fellowship in this place and the opportunity to come and to worship you. And we thank you for your presence and your abiding joy with us. Lord, this day we come before you knowing that even the deepest prayers of our hearts will never pass our lips, but you hear them still. And we pray that we will know you in big and small ways as we go through the days that you have granted us. We pray all of these things, O oh Lord, in the, in the name that you hold above all others and using the words that you yourself teach us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our scripture readings this morning both come from Paul's letters. The first is from 2 Corinthians, and the second is from Paul's letter to the church in Rome. I invite you to hear now God's word to the church today. First from 2 Corinthians, I'll be reading from chapter 4, verses 5 through 7, and I believe this is on the back of the bulletin. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may, may, it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading this morning, also one of Paul's epistles, is from Romans chapter 14, verses 5 through 9. Again, hear what the Spirit tells us this day. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord, and those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord, and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Friends, this is also the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before we go too far, I need to let you know at least one thing about me and about the way uh, worship sort of happens with me, and that is, uh, it's about my robe. It's kind of a technical thing, but I'll tell you about it, and I'll move around a little bit. Hope that doesn't scare anybody, but I'll move around a little bit and so I can show you. This robe is not mine. It does not belong to me. I do not know the man it belonged to. Now, there's a story. 
in my first year of seminary, right at the end of the first year, as we got ready, Byron, to go up to West Jefferson, I needed a robe because they told me I'd be preaching more than actually I thought I would be, but I needed a robe, and I found out, and so I said, okay, what do we need to do to go get a robe? And I looked online, and I found out that robes were expensive, and I didn't want to go buy one. So I was mulling over this problem, and I talked to some people there at Columbia Seminary, and they said, well, you know, there's an old robe room that you can go check out. And then I went and asked a staff member, and they said they didn't know anything about a robe room. I said, well, that's not good. And then I asked another staff member, and they said they thought they remembered something about a room where maybe there were some robes. It turns out on uh, the second floor, way back, tucked away, there was an old closet that was used uh, for some other stuff, and there was a mop and a broom and some other things in there. And there were, on the other side of the wall, well forgotten, a number of robes hanging up. They said I was welcome to any of them. So I went in and I checked out the robes that were hanging there. And, uh, you know, it's potluck. And uh, some of those robes had been uh, feasted on by moths or other kinds of critters. Who knows? I tried on one that looked promising. It was silver, though. I was a little uncomfortable with that. I'm kind of a black robe kind of guy. And it was silver, but it, it cut off about here sort of a Bermuda shorts kind of robe type thing. <laughs> so I said, no, that won't work. And I was about to give up, and I was about to figure that I was going to have to go and purchase something that I hadn't anticipated. And then I saw this one robe at the very back that I hadn't looked at before, and so I put it on and tried it on. And it was, you know, I looked at it, it looked like it was in pretty good shape, and I said, well, I'll give this robe a try. It's this robe. And the first thing I noticed was the, it has these cuffs down here, and they broke right at my wrist. And the second thing I noticed was it fit fine in the shoulder. And it looked like it was in pretty good shape. It didn't need to be taken care of. And the shoulders just fit just right, right across, like almost like it was made for me. And I said, this, this robe is a winner. This is perfect. I'll wear it. So I wore it all summer in West Jefferson. And as it turns out, then, and, and I went back and I told the folks there, I said, I borrowed this robe. I don't know if anybody's going up there to look for it. But I'd like to use it over the course of the year. And they said, that's fine. Just give it back before you leave school. And, and I'll just, spoiler alert, I'm not in possession of a stolen robe right now. <laughs> I wore it the next year. I wore it all through seminary. And when I came to graduate, I'd sort of become attached to it because I'd tried some others on and none of them ever fit. The sleeves were too long or too short. It didn't come down to the right length on my legs uh, it, and it didn't fit in the shoulders. It bunched up. So if I start hooping and hollering, which doesn't happen often, but uh, <laughs> basketball season maybe, um, you know, I could, there's plenty of movement available. And so I took the robe up to the office of the person who directed all of that, and I said, Kim, uh, I really like this robe. I think I'd like to keep it. And she said, well, you know, we try to keep these things around. I said, well, let me just put it on. I want to show you something. And I put it on, and she said, wow, that robe looks like it was made for you. I said, yeah, it kind of does. And she said, keep it and use it and carry it with you. So this is the robe I've worn since seminary. It reminds me of uh, a couple of things. It reminds me of where I came from. And it reminds me of that day of looking for robes. And it reminds me that someone else wore this robe probably for many years. He has his initials stitched into the back of it. And I'm not taking them out. It reminds me that the message that I'm privileged to deliver is not really my own wasn't really his. That I'm just occupying a space and I'm privileged to use this robe for a little while. And perhaps someday someone presumably built similar to, to me will get the chance to wear it and use it also. Now I tell you about the robe because you already know about my watch. I, you've been watching me, I know. You, I, this is the pitfall of putting everything you do on YouTube. People watch you and so people have come up to me and said, we've seen that sermon or the other one. 
and, and that's scary because one of them was a sermon I didn't really like. And so anyway, but you know about my watch. It kind of fits in with my robe. You know about my watch because I told the PNC about it in my, uh, in my cover letter and in that brochure. And by the way, let me just say, John Coleman is in the right line of work. He, uh, putting together that brochure out of the materials that we sent in, I saw the brochure and I said, wow, I, I don't even know who that person is. Jennifer looked at it and said, I'd like to meet that preacher. <laughs> I said, well, honey, that's me. And she said, oh, okay. Well, any it's not my robe. And this is not my watch either. This watch belongs to my grandfather, or belonged to my grandfather, Wren's namesake, that is. They gave it to him after a career of carrying the mail, but Papa Butler always wanted to be a preacher or a minister, and indeed he was. And so at the end of his career, his congregation, the people on his rural route, the ones he took care of, not only by delivering them the mail, but by making sure they had enough food or enough of whatever it was that they needed, they chipped in and they bought him a watch. Y'all know about that. I, I wear it every time I preach. It's not mine either. I just wanted y'all to know. Now, coming to our scripture this morning, we meet Paul uh, in two different places in his life, writing about two different things. Well, not really different. He's writing both times into places of conflict. First, to the church in Corinth, which he had started, and then secondly, into the church in Rome, where he was hoping to go and visit at some point in time, uh, and he had heard, we think, of some conflict going on there. Now, these verses are not normally paired together. One of them fit with the lectionary today, and it was indeed the one I would have chosen anyway. And they are usually preached into settings of conflict, settings of discord, of unrest, or often, I should say. Now, You'd say, well, why would you do that on a day like this? This is the culmination of the search of the PNC. You have finally moved. This is a joyous day, and indeed it is. There's no conflict here, and it doesn't appear that there is. Well, now, I will stop for a second. There does appear to be a gross uh, confusion about where Carolina actually is. <laughs> I wouldn't call it conflict, but it's certainly odd. Not conflict, but a message all the same that's important for us on this special and day, a special day that is far from ordinary. Now, in Second Corinthians, Paul is writing to a church that he started. He's irritated with them because, uh, in his time having gone away from them, some folks have come in and tried to uh, sort of supplant what Paul had been teaching. And and the church there wrote back to him and said, "Paul, these guys have been telling us these things, and they say that you're not as great as we thought you were." And Paul is trying to reestablish his authority, and he goes about it in an interesting fashion. Instead of saying all of the great things he's done, which he does a little bit of. I mean, he's Paul after all, and he, he's going to do that. But in this place, he defers from himself. And in that way, takes the power away from the opposition, as he calls them. And he points towards Christ. He establishes all the authority towards Christ and he says, you know, it's not about preaching about me. It's not the gospel of Paul I'm preaching. It's not the gospel of these other uh, folks that are preaching into your congregation that is being preached. It's the gospel of Christ. And so, in deflecting back to him, whether he was writing in a fit of anger or whether he was really using just a rhetorical trick to make his argument. It doesn't matter because we benefit from the way he put together those verses. We benefit from his pointing away from ourselves. 
pointing away from who we are and pointing to who God is and what God has done and what God is doing. Now in the Romans passage, uh, a little bit of conflict's going on there. There's some discord at least over uh, what it means to observe certain days and what it means to eat certain things at certain times. And so there's a disagreement uh, about that. And Paul is really not having any of that. He says, you know, it's not about us. It's not about whether you eat, uh, you eat this kind of food or that kind of food or you celebrate this day or the other day. We do all of it to God's glory. But if we look at these verses together, we find that the thing that unifies both of them is that we are not talking about ourselves. Those same two words pop up both times, not ourselves. Now, even in the Romans passage, which you will hear me preach most often times at funerals, we're talking about how we don't live to ourselves and we don't die to ourselves, but in all things, we belong to God. It's the thing I like to remind people of when we come together to celebrate lives and to return some of our own. But the not ourselves idea, years apart, letters apart, worlds apart, centuries apart from us still rings true that we are not talking about ourselves when we come together. We're talking about what God is doing. That's our calling. Now it's easy sometimes to get caught up in different callings. It's easy to get caught up in our own personal ideas and agendas our own identities, so to speak. But Paul calls us back. Even though it's doubtful he was thinking of one letter as he wrote the other one, again, years and places apart, Paul reminds us, the Spirit reminds us in this place that it's not about ourselves, it's about what God's doing in our midst. Now, y'all know about my watch. I just told you, you've heard about it. Susan uh, Todd got up here and told you about it during the congregational meeting that this watch that I wear that's my grandfather's. You don't know the rest of the story about the watch. I didn't include that in the letter, and I haven't told any of you about that. You see, I, I didn't get many things from my grandfather. Uh, aside from knowing, I didn't know him very well. I was uh, three or four when he passed away, but... Uh, I do remember, I have one vivid memory of going to a car wash with him. And I don't know why, I just do. Uh, at any rate, I have three things of his. One was uh, a sword that had been passed down through the family. That's a Civil War sword that was his. And uh, not during the Civil War, but it, was, it belonged to him and it's passed through the family to me. Uh, the other two things that were uniquely my grandfather's were his Bible, which sits in my office, and uh, of course the watch. Now, when I came into possession of the watch at a young age, 12 or 13, it was in disrepair. The, the face was colored badly. It had eroded some. I guess there was some rust involved. Uh, some of the gold plating had come off of it. Uh, it didn't work. I, I never had much hope that it would. And so I did what most young men do as they go through time. I put it in that, uh, that cup, or uh, it was a cup. It was a big plastic cup. Um, and I'd keep change and other special things in there. And so I kept, uh, I kept Grandpa's watch in there. And to be honest, I didn't think about it very much. It was just something that I knew I had. I didn't know it was gone. I didn't know it had disappeared. And then the night before Jennifer and I got married... And I didn't know, by the way, I didn't know that when you get married, you have to give a wedding gift to your wife. <laughs> they had to tell me that. It was the awfulest thing. I was trying to get a honeymoon paid for, and they said, well, what are you going to give Jennifer? And I said, a ring? <laughs> and they said, no, you have to give her a gift, too. And then I had a, a sister that helped me figure that one out. 
anyway, it turns out Jennifer had to give me a gift too. And what she gave me was my grandfather's watch. She had taken it to a jeweler in town. She knew it was special to me and she knew I wouldn't notice it was gone. She'd taken it to a jeweler in town and she had had it completely restored. It's kept almost perfect time to this day. And now engraved on the back of it are the words, I love you, and her initials. Love transformed a relatively inexpensive piece of metal, a timepiece, but love transformed it into something more than what it had been. And now, it's more than just a watch. It's more than just something I look to to see what time of day it is. It's something that reminds me of other people. But more than that, it reminds me of what love can do when properly motivated. So what about us? What about each of us sitting here? What about these things that we cherish, that we've come to see every Sunday or every Wednesday or every time that you came into this sanctuary, every Christmas? You know, it occurs to me this morning that just as this is not my robe and this is not really my watch, they're just mine for a little while, this is not my pulpit. And as delightful a conversation as I had earlier this week with Mark Coker, who loves you dearly and who you dearly loved, he knows too that this was not his pulpit either and it wasn't any of the 15 men that came before him. That this is God's place. And we're privileged to be here and be a part of what happens here when we worship. Now maybe that's not personal enough, and, and I don't know if this is the case here, but it's, I've seen some other churches where there are certain seats that certain people tend to sit in week after week. Is that correct? <laughs> now you're in the choir, so you're pretty safe. I mean, that's, that's okay. You work here. Is that true? Are there seats that if I were to get here real early and I was just coming to worship, are there seats where I might get uh, perhaps a side-eye look from someone if I were sitting in them <laughs> and I had to reach the seat before they did? Is that, if that, just let me know after the service. <laughs> I've heard that that happens somewhere. <laughs> I noticed that that doesn't appear to be the case with the front row. <laughs> you know, it's not our seats either. I joked with people, and you've heard this too, that I can still, from where I'm standing, see the seat where I used to sit when I was in the congregation. I'm still new to all this in many respects. I know what it is to be comfortable. I know what it feels like to have my own place that I can see the preacher like I want to or not see the preacher like I want to and where the air conditioner hits me just right. And I know what it feels like to see somebody come sit in my seat and then I have to move and I don't feel right the whole day. You know, it's the same thing with this building and the name that's outside on the building. This is not, these are not our seats and I'm not asking anyone to move. Don't, don't hear that. But remember, these are not our seats. This is not really our building. This is just the place that we've been called to for this time in our lives to come and worship the living God and to be energized and equipped to go out and serve God. And so we remember that these things are not our own. They're things that we are privileged to take care of. We preach not ourselves. We preach not ourselves because it's not about us. It's not the gospel of Mike McCracken. It's not the gospel of Paul. It's not the gospel of the third intro that the choir sings on Sunday morning. It's not the gospel that only takes if you sit in the right seat or you go to the right church on Sunday morning. It's not about us. 
It's not about all these things that we perceive belong to us. It's about the one to whom we all belong. The one who formed us, created us, redeems us and sustains us. It's about who we belong to in this place while we are privileged to serve. And on a day like this, when it's tempting for me to think it's all about me, to get really excited and think this is Mike McCracken Day in Lawrence, South Carolina, and it sure in many ways felt like it. I about wrecked my car when I came down the street and saw that sign outside with my name in big letters on it. I didn't know that was going to happen. And when you're driving down the road and you see your sign like that, it's, 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 it's kind of scary. It might be tempting to think it's all about us on this day where we're celebrating coming to a different chapter in the life of this congregation. And this is indeed a joyful day for all of us. But the truth of the matter is it's not about us either. It's not about us. And that's why I'm grateful for this robe. This robe, as much as anything, helps me remember that it's not about me. That there were many, many, I suspect and hope and pray, good sermons that were preached by the man that wore this robe long before I did. That the Spirit moved in him. And it moved in the people who heard him. It's not about this watch. This watch that I'm privileged and honored to wear that didn't belong to me to start with but was transformed by love and now works properly and I'm able to use it and will one day be able to pass it on. It's not about this pulpit where men have come Women have come and preached the good news. And so on this day, may we remember this place. Just as I remember my robe and my watch, may we remember this sanctuary and all the saints who have come and worshipped in this place, those who have gone from us but are not truly departed. For we're still gathered with them in the great company of saints. Most of all, may we remember that it's not about us. It's not about ourselves. Like I said, I don't think Paul was trying to piece those two letters together. I don't think he gave it a second thought. Well, I mentioned this to the Corinthians, so now I'll mention it to the Romans. It's not about ourselves, but boy, those words ring as clear as a bell when we lay them next to each other. It's not about ourselves. his bedrock understanding of what things were really about. About the one who calls us. The one who sends us. The one who cares for us and sustains us. This is the seed of his reminder that it's not about you and me. But about the one who puts us into the world to serve and to take care of all creation. And so friends, in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, Amen. Friends, the word has been read, the word has been proclaimed. So let us rise and join together and use the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed to affirm our faith as we prepare to go out into the world. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, you may be seated. We are called to offer ourselves just as Christ came to offer himself to us as a living sacrifice. So let us do so now by giving of our tithes and offerings and prayerfully considering how we may offer ourselves as we go out into the world.
Friends, let us pray. Holy and loving God, we give thanks for these gifts and all who have given them. We pray, Lord, that you will put them to work in this place and places even beyond our imagination so that we may all be partners in building of your kingdom. We pray, Lord, that you will make us, as we leave this place, the hands and the feet of the body of Christ so that we may do your service for all that we meet. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. we preach not ourselves not even this place not even this robe or this watch or the name on the building we preach nothing less than the gospel of Jesus Christ the one who came for us who died for us and who lives for us so friends in the name of God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit go from this place in peace Rejoicing always in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>